Hey everyone, Dennis Friel here. Thanks for joining us today for a very special edition of the Connected by Water podcast. As most of you know by now, we lost a legend uh, this past week and uh, Mr. Jimmy Buffett, who meant a lot to us here at the studio. And we kind of wanted to do a tribute to him. We feel like we just needed to say something to a man that meant so much to us. Uh, as it did for us, came to a, came to us as a shock uh, when we woke up Saturday morning to find out uh, what had happened and that we lost someone that we loved very much. As far as this tribute goes, I didn't want to come up with something where I was just sitting here, rambling on, fumbling over my words. But what I found in myself all day Saturday was I just started writing. Not by plan and not by saying, hey, I got want to do this. I just grabbed my phone and my notes, my iPhone, and I just started writing. And I kept writing. Just pouring my thoughts into the phone. So what I came up with was this that's in front of me, and I want to read it to you. It's just a little something um, that I felt was important for me to share. That is cathartic for me. And in many ways, this is probably a self-indulgent endeavor. But Jimmy Buffett meant a lot to me. Jimmy Buffett meant a lot to everybody here at Connected by Water. In a lot of ways, he's one of the reasons that we started it in the first place. So, I'm going to read. And I hope you enjoy it. Let me just start this off by saying that there are people who knew him better than I did. Way better. There are people that have had deeper and more meaningful experiences with him than I've had. There are those that have had better stories than I do. But this story is mine. As I pour a fresh glass of Hemingway family's own Papa's Pilar rum, I'm telling it to you now with Nick here. So we both say cheers to you, Jimmy. This is my Jimmy Buffett story. Like you do, I actually have a lot of Jimmy Buffett stories shared with many different friends. But I like to tell this one the best. In fact, before I really get started, I'll even add this. I'm only telling my story because I know you've probably got one to tell too. So you'll likely be able to relate to this. I know there are so many of you who have had in your own ways a way that he touched your life and helped change the way that you see it all. He had a gift and he shared it with us. He invented a culture that was so unique for us. He cleared the path for the Caribbean cowboy opened up the lines to the Coconut Telegraph, handed us the keys to Margaritaville, and made us all citizens of a banana republic. And it went so much deeper than that, too. I could really sit here and make this about not only that, but also the amazingly good things he did. Sure, Jimmy Buffett party better than any of them. He definitely enjoyed his time here on planet Earth. We can just leave that at that. I also have it on good authority that Jimmy Buffett helped so many people. He anonymously gave to so many organizations. Did so much good. Way more than he cared to credit, take credit for. Way more than you know. He just wanted us to see the good side of each other. That's the way he went out. I 
thought about coming up with some fun and quirky way to approach this by intertwining as many great lyrics, one-liners, catchphrases. And the man was an artist, an author, a songwriter, multi-generational, inspiring, creative genius, and entrepreneur. More than the music industry ever truly gave him credit for, too. I could get into all that. It would be a book as long as so many of the ones he wrote. And I've read most of them. As you know, you know most of that stuff already. And I'm not here to talk about them. I'm not here to recite an unauthorized Jimmy Buffett biography. I'm here to simply tell my own tale about it. Because to me, retelling it is the only way to get past this. See, I'm having a tougher time processing the death of Jimmy Buffett more than I imagined I would. Particularly as an artist that was so inspired by him since my childhood. It's really only been a few days, but for me, Buffett was interplanetary ever present, someone I was in denial would ever be gone. Well, that time is here. What do we do with it? There's this big hole. What do we put in it? You know, I know some of you have, but I never actually met him in person. I really thought that I eventually would. Maybe that's the toughest part for me. Even though towards the end I was able to do some work for him by creating artwork and apparel for his boat, personally designing and putting the last stamp on the stern of the last mango, a well-documented custom build he had collaborated on with both Freeman and Merritt Boat Works. Even though I had the absolute honor of having a hand in designing, printing, and helping launch the last Mango Boatworks brand. Heck, I even, when I worked in the music business for 17 years with colleagues that had pretty good connections to him, I never had the opportunity to meet him, shake his hand, and explain to him what an influence he was on my life. Personally, creatively, professionally. I don't say these things about the projects that tout my clout, but rather mention it cathartically for me to explain how working on this stuff was, was one of the greatest honors of my career. Truly. Not meeting him well. That will likely go down as one of my life's greatest incompletes now that he's gone. Turns out my last link to him was his boat captain and my good friend, Captain Vinny LaSorsa, who is absolutely one of the greatest guys that I've ever met. When we were in the concept phase of developing this podcast, 162 episodes ago, we were starting to line up guests. And when the big decision of who to launch episode one came up, I didn't hesitate to say to my camp, Vinny and Sarah, for sure. We were fortunate that they said yes, and we were blessed to be able to spotlight Sarah's amazing veterans organization, Freedom Fighter Outdoors, and talk about then in progress yet almost complete Jimmy Buffett, Billy Freeman, Roy Merritt artistically designed vessel collaboration known better as The Last Mango. Something about a boat. Thankful for all this. So even though we never met, I still had a relationship with Buffett, like many of you had, albeit physically distant and somewhat vicarious. It was timeless. Being a Florida native, growing up fishing, diving, surfing, and doing all the fun things that living in Florida life has to offer. Of course, Exposed me to being raised in the breezily, palmy shadow of that tropical western twang. If you grew up like I did, 
which most of you that listen to this show have. And I don't need to explain this to you. It's a painting that you already have in your head. And it's warm, wet, and salty. You know how it was growing up here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Margaritaville followed us everywhere. And it covered us like a cozy blanket of lime, salt, and sunshine. I know his music was global. I mean, he was a nationwide household name. But growing up with Buffett in Florida was a completely different experience, especially in the Keys. That's not to diminish the reach, impact, and influence he had. But Florida, that signature Buffett sound would seemingly just fall out of the sky sometimes. It became part of the land here in Florida, no matter what your preferred musical genre was. It was as if the palm trees were his personal speakers he had strategically installed all over the place. At times, simply hearing a blender turned on when the weather got north of 80 degrees seemed like a Buffett song. In a lot of ways, for a lot of people, he was Florida. My first time seeing Jimmy Buffett at the Coral Reef Band in concert, I was a sophomore in high school. My self-adopted second parents, Greg and Susan Bennett, took my pal, their son, Chris Bennett, and I to see him at the old Sunrise Musical Theater. Even though I had listened to him and his music a thousand times already, I felt as if my relationship with him and the Reefers had now been consummated. I had now seen him play live. After this glorious evening filled with feathers and beach balls, after finning to the left and finning to the right for the first time, the concert hall filled with all my new best friends. I indoctrinated myself as an official pair in. And Jimmy Buffett became my Jerry Garcia, my Elvis. I was so deep into it that in my 20s, I even named my dog Savannah Jane. If you know, you know. I would later see him play in person well over 20 times. Sometimes with the same friends. Sometimes with new ones. Every time a unique experience. It became interesting reflecting on my own life based upon where I was mentally during any given Buffett show. Over time, I wasn't as hardcore about it like I was when I was younger. It's always been a part of me. I still love it all just the same. Now, my most memorable Buffett concert of all would be early on with one of my best friends, Andy. This show is special and unique in that it was a situation where Jimmy had announced that the event, he announced it only a few days prior. The Manatee census had come out and Jimmy didn't like the numbers. The report had stated that there were a mere 100 manatees left or something close to that number. So he decided to do a fundraiser. We heard my now good pal, Paul Castronovo announced this impromptu event on the radio and that tickets were going on sale that morning. So Andy and I looked at each other and all he did was raise both eyebrows and delightfully say with a smile, shit. Immediately, we both entered into full party hero crisis mode, changed the course of our morning's navigation, proceeded to skip class and head straight to Blockbuster Video which for any of you youngins listening, was a very important place in the 80s and 90s. We somehow pulled off being third in line to buy tickets as a gangload of people quickly filled the sidewalk behind us. Here we are, two juniors in high school with our private school uniforms on, waiting outside in a line filled with adults during school and work hours for Buffett tickets. Two true, proud parrot heads. We scored great seats, and three nights later we were there, once again at the Sunrise Musical Theater. On stage was just Jimmy, a slightly worn Martin acoustic, a bar stool, and a lamp. It was like seeing him play in a bar, like a personal performance. We were in the fifth row. We were 17. 
we may or may not have been slightly inebriated. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. And it's important to understand some key details to this story. You see, Andy and I grew up together since we were babies. We carpooled to school every morning during our junior and senior years at high school. We both went to Cardinal Gibbons in Fort Lauderdale. And for those who don't know, it was a well-to-do private Catholic high school. And Andy and I did not grow up well-to-do kids. We came from the other side of the tracks. We didn't grow up poor, but we weren't exactly rolling in it either. One might say we were the West Side boys that educated a lot of those kids at the school on what a real party was. Anyway, I had this live concert cassette tape recording aptly titled, You Had to Be There. You may know it. It was an MCA released 1978 live Buffett performance from the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. I listened to it seemingly every day. It reminded me of my, at the time, only Jimmy Buffett concert experience from just a few months earlier. It transported me back to that night every time I listened to it. Even though I grew up listening to his music while fishing, lobstering, and hermit crab hunting in the Keys, I was really now just coming into my prime Buffett appreciation era. After all, I was no longer a little boy. I was now an official parahead, you know? The tape was awesome. Jimmy performed with a broken leg and everything, which I later discovered had an original painting on the cast from legendary and amazing artist Von Cochran, who I now call both friend and fellow artist. Certainly was the stuff a legend. And there was one particular song on that album that really struck a chord with me. Well, it wasn't so much as a song as it was a story. See, I like stories, as if you couldn't tell. It was called God's Own Drunk. Since our morning drive to Gibbons was a little over half an hour each morning, we had plenty of time to hear the story of the moonshine still, the 19-foot tall drunken Kodiak, and how the stars would shine on a cool, clear evening. So every morning, I had it teed up in my 1984 Toyota Celica, ready for Andy and his little sister Nicole, who we allowed to ride with us. Many times she would just roll her eyes and say, Oh no. Not the song about the bear again. Andy and I would laugh as we just as if we were just playing a joke specifically on her. We proceeded to recite the story word for word. So here we are at the concert. A mere 20 or 30 feet away from the man himself. We could see the strands of his hair. Of course, my eyesight was much better back then. Certainly, if we said something, he'd be able to hear us. Three songs in, I turned to Andy and I said, he has to play it. He has to. Andy just gave me the signature Joker grin he'd get when he started having a good time. And there it was. No sooner did I suggest it that he blurt out, God's own drunk. Andy broke into a shameful hidden face giggle behind my shoulder while still sitting. Jimmy didn't budge, but I know he heard it. I tried not to react as if to give my body language like I didn't know who this dude next to me was, thinking we're certainly going to get kicked out if I laughed. Jimmy continued to play, and the crowd was getting more and more warmed up. The room was quickly turning into Duval Street, epic song after epic song. Didn't take long for a few other lone and distant voices to start yelling out requests to the troubadour, too. Most of which he ignored, some of which he placated. That made me feel better. A couple of tunes later, having a great time, we were starting to get our confidence up, as did most of the congregation. Now standing up, both of us yelled out during the next song break, God's own drunk! Nothing. Another song, and then a third time. God's own drunk! To which Andy added, And a fearless man! Then it happened. Mr. Buffett turned to us and half laughingly said, All right, all right. You boys take it easy. I remember my first beer too. We didn't know what to do with that. Did Jimmy Buffett communicate to us as pals? 
Did he just scold us like a parent would? We were still kids after all. Illegally having a couple of beers to boot. A couple of young deer buzzing in the headlights. And we felt the whole theater's eyes on us. So Jimmy just winked at us and continued on playing the most intimate version of grapefruit juicy fruit I had ever heard. As if to say, let's just chill out a little bit. Then what happened next for me was everything. After the clapping crowd sound faded down, Jimmy said, this next song is from a new friends over here. I haven't played this song since. Jimmy paused and scratched his head as if to recall forgotten performances. Anyway, in a while, he gave us a wink, a smile, and said, Don't ever stop being parrotheads, boys. This one's for y'all. <sighs> then I heard those E7 and A7 chords bang out as he proceeded to strum and pluck away. Well, live I have explained in this town many times before, I ain't a drinking man. As the tale goes. He played it. And he played it beautifully, note for note, word for word, and we were fully engulfed in relaxed revelry. Likely a simple, forgotten moment for him, just a band doing what he does, a defining moment of our youth for us. 30 years later, Andy and I still talk about it. And it's the reason I taught myself how to play guitar. What a night. Listening to Jimmy Buffett's music and stories and studying the man taught me that along the way, I may have ran right into some lawyers and assholes. And at times there might be a woman or two to blame. It also taught me not to allow those changes in latitudes to affect who I was as an artist or a person. That Havana daydreaming every now and then isn't a bad thing. As long as you do some good too. And create some meaningful work in the process. There I go. Doing that funny quirky lyric thing I said I wouldn't do. My Jimmy Buffett story I told is just that. It's a story, a story about the great storyteller, a memory to me that illustrates who he was. He was a superstar flying Desdemona's rocket ship, yet a man of the people. He was a friend to us all and the leader of a movement, the poet and the priest of an imaginary island paradise who believed that there was a fine line between Saturday night and Sunday morning. The influence of Jimmy Buffett for me showed that there was a certified path in life to mix business and pleasure, a roadmap to break the rules of the real world and create your own world, a place where creativity could flow, fun be had, work turn into passion, and a living be made. That for me would be paint and fish drawing boats, and finding different ways to approach and look at how and why I did that. It inspired me to look at the world connected by water in hopes to share that like-minded philosophy with y'all. We're going to miss you, Jimmy Buffett. There will never be another one quite like you. If you can hear us, thank you for everything. It's five o'clock in heaven. I imagine you smiling down at us all thinking, the weather is here. Right. Your ego, it's not your amigo. Always do your best and at the end of the day, just let God do the rest. And do not ever forget that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're all connected by water.